he was just absolutely ecstatic that he was going to be here for the next five years and maybe more. Joe Musgrove is really the savior and the example. He's proving it night in and night out. Hopefully he's here in, in the Padre uniform for a long time. How freaking cool is that? Go get him, Joe. And a swing and a miss. And grab it back to Musgrove, who bare hands it. Joe Musgrove is a man of character. I feel like I learned a lot about myself in here tonight. And I was just very proud of the man that he became. Joe Musgrove gets it from every angle. Joe Musgrove is trying to make history tonight. And he gets it done. The San Diego Padres get their first no hitter. Joe Musgrove, San Diego, California. You're watching Padre Spotlight. This is one heck of a script right here going on before our very eyes. Kid from El Cajon, pitching in Little League in San Diego, looking for a little bit of history here tonight. That night of the no-hitter, set up the towel, set up the gum, nine pieces of gum. The idea being that I could just chew a piece of gum every half inning, and by the end of the game, hopefully I go through all that gum. Joe Musgrove has gone eight and two-thirds, and is an out away. Shortstop. Kim will go to first. That is a no hitter, and that is history. Joe Musgrove, April 9th, 2021, at Globe Life Field in Arlington, Texas. I mean, that was just an incredible moment. I can't even express how excited I was. <laughs> I'm just so happy that Joe was one that got it. When it's the first one, you feel the energy through a TV screen. That is going to go down to me as one of the greatest moments in Padre history. All I could think about was like, God, I got so much pressure now to not, to not screw this up. I got to continue to be good. We got a phone call from the Padres team that they were doing something here at Grossmont High School to commemorate it, and we didn't know what it was. They just asked for us to come. Joe was obviously in Texas, so he couldn't be there. So we showed up here, and they showed us what they had done with the mural outside of the theater and asked us to FaceTime Joe. And he got on FaceTime with us and we showed him and he was he was stunned. He had no idea, but he was really excited about it. What? How freaking cool is that? As it meant to be. How sick is that? They got that up quick, huh? That's incredible, you guys. That is so cool. And you know, that's my high school too, so it's it's real special to me. Who is that? Who is that? <laughs> That's my joke. I know. And getting a mural anywhere is pretty cool, and having it go up in my high school, I mean, it's incredible. This is all, all this stuff is something that I never expected to come or I never dreamed of or planned of. These little simple rewards throughout the course of a season can be, you know, big motivators for you pushing forward. And, you know, hopefully kids that are going to Grossmont now playing baseball will walk past that mural and be like, I could be me one day, you know? Um, so, yeah, it feels really good. It feels like it was meant to be. It feels like it's full circle. Coming up on this edition of Padre Spotlight, Joe Musgrove takes center stage. We all ended up doing tap dancing. And we used to go to the Del Mar Fair when I was young and I would perform there every year. He loves to hold this over my head that he's the only one that didn't mess up in the performance. We dive into what makes Joe's <laughs> off-season workouts so unique. I don't think anybody can go underwater for an extended amount of time and not experience that, that sense of panic or nerves that set in. Plus, hear from his family on the moment that made No-No Joe a hometown hero. We all just hugged each other. We were crying. Everybody was just kind of in shock. And I started bawling. Having him be the first no-hitter in franchise history is so special to our family, but I know how special it is to him. Padre Spotlight with Joe Musgrove will be right back. Before Joe Musgrove was ever immortalized into Padres history, before ever winning a World Series ring or even becoming a first round draft pick, the dream of playing professional ball, like most big leaguers, started at an early age for the El Cajon native. 
Joe was uh, always full of energy. In diapers and a t-shirt, he'd have the, the plastic bat in his t-ball stand. He'd run around the kitchen table and slide into the couch. Couldn't wait to go play somewhere. Very, very active. He had a lot of that stereotypical boy energy. I would sit there and I have ball games on and I would sit there talking to Joe at two weeks old explaining the rules and uh, you know explaining why I was frustrated about certain aspects of the game and the calls and things of that nature. Nobody believes me but I knew he understood me and I knew that he understood what his future was going to be in sports. He was I mean he was the one that introduced me to baseball he was you know he was everything to me. He's my hero. My dad was a cop for 20 years down in National City in San Diego PD. And he was the one that taught me everything about work ethic and how to be a man, how to respect people, you know, all the qualities that I feel like I have today, a lot of that comes from him. And even at a young age, I mean, you know, when you talk to Joe, his vocabulary as it pertained to, to baseball and things incorporated things like work ethic. It incorporated things like values and things of that nature. It was always about effort and the process of becoming better. So, you know, I started realizing how important that really is at a young age to fall in love with the work that you put into becoming a better player more so than the result itself. From a team standpoint, he was always a Padres fan. He always uh, wanted to get to Qualcomm early so he could get uh, batting practice and get out in the home run area. And then that transitioned uh, to Petco in 04 when they opened up. Joe's just always been a baseball fan, always been, you know, a guy that wanted to be around the ballpark. If you were to ask him who his favorite Padre was, well, number one was Tony, but number two was PV. PV seemed to come right at that period of time where, um, you know, throwing a strikeout pitch and walking off the mound screaming and, you know, into your glove or doing something that was a little reserved, but nonetheless showing an emotion was something that he liked because he felt that emotion when he had degrees of success on the field. You know, watching PV and the way that he went about his work on the mound kind of gave me the reassurance that, you know, you can you can be yourself out there and you can act the way you want to act. And, you know, his stats, you know, along the way were incredible. But yeah, I think the person and the player that he was was what was most exciting to me. Joe, as the younger brother in the family, was a very rambunctious kid, always a very athletic kid. Um, he was super close with Tara just because they grew up so close in age, they did everything together. Joe, as a kid growing up, was, he was chaotic sometimes. <laughs> always the type to go back and forth and like always want to do better than each other. So it was always like if we're going to go play basketball, we'd play one-on-one -on -one together. We'd go across the street and use the neighbor's hoop. He was always that kid that was good at everything that he did. He was just always always fun to be around. I always remember Joe as the kind of kid that wanted to try everything at least once. He was daring in wanting to play every sport, wanting to get involved in any kind of arts that he could. The arts played a large role in the Musgrove household. Five, six, seven, eight. Oh, the things you can think, stop! Oh, the things you can think, be quiet! Joe's sister, Marisa, has previously acted, directed, and currently teaches musical theater in San Diego. Yes, I love that. I grew up in a performing arts school. We did tap dance, theater, acting, all that stuff from like elementary uh, or from kindergarten through about sixth grade. So since the time Joe was born, he had always seen me going to dance classes, voice lessons, doing shows. And being so little, he got dragged around to a lot of my dance classes. He started learning how to dance and learning how to sing and, you know, playing music and all that kind of stuff at a very young age. We all ended up doing tap dancing. And that, I feel like, really helped Joe kind of express at a young age, be comfortable to talk in front of people and be in front of crowds. We used to go to the Del Mar Fair when I was young and I would perform there every year. Um, you know, we do a little dance routine, me and my sisters. He loves to hold this over my head that he's the only one that didn't mess up in the performance. Like, I had turned the wrong way and our other sister had like slipped somewhere and Joe was like, I've got this. And you just covered the rest of the show up. Was like, I'll do this all by myself. I cared about it a lot at the time. And then I got into that like sixth, seventh grade year and. I started noticing none of my guy friends were doing that stuff anymore and I was a little embarrassed and I kind of pushed myself out of it. And he just came home one day and he said, Dad, I think I'm ready to play baseball full time. 
As Joe stepped away from the stage and continued to grow into his teens, he and his family made baseball a priority. The travel ball circuit would take the Musgroves all over the country, watching Joe play the game they all loved. Joe um, played on, always played on real competitive travel ball teams, San Diego Stars. Um, when we would go to tournaments and things like that, we would make it a family affair. If anybody knows and plays travel ball, it's always during the summer. So a majority of our family vacations would be the one big trip that we would take to wherever he was playing. And I played year round. Um, you know, I went from Little League to travel ball to all stars and it was just constantly baseball all year round. So me and my dad would be at the field all day long working and then, uh, you know, my sisters and mom would join us for the game and my whole family loved baseball. So it was enjo enjoyable for them as well. I asked my parents for a Palm Pilot for my birthday one year so I could sit in the dugout and keep score and then eventually graduated to a regular scorebook. So it was fun for me um, because I love baseball. Joe, uh, he handled all that so well and never ever had second doubts about playing ball. When high school came, there was no stopping him. Coming up. I was a sophomore in high school and my dad got sick. As a wife and a mother and having a business to run, it wasn't easy. I mean, it was life changing for me at the time. I was 15 and, you know, for a minute, I thought I was gonna lose my dad. Padre Spotlight will be right back. You're watching Padre Spotlight. Most professional athletes have daily routines. Joe Musgrove started his routine back when he was nearly 10 years old, when his parents opened a coffee shop in Alpine, California. My parents bought a coffee shop back in 98, I think 98 and 99. Cafe Desso, a little coffee shop up in the mountains. You know, it's been a small little, I think it was one of the first drive throughs in San Diego before drive through coffee was even a thing. They started, we always had coffee in the house and I don't know if it's just my family are an Italian thing, but it was coffee after every meal, breakfast, lunch, dinner, didn't matter what time of day it was, it was always hot coffee on. So when I started drinking, I was probably eight, eight or nine and I was loading it up with creamers and sugars and whatnot. And I just thought it was cool to drink coffee because my dad was drinking coffee. We'd go over to the coffee shop and, and Diane would put him to work over there. And yeah, and he loved the tips. And then I had my Starbucks gold card in high school. I thought I was all cool because I was drinking coffee all the time. And I just really fell in love with the process of making the coffee. It, just, it was cool to get up in the morning, you grind your beans fresh. Um, you know, you set your, you get your water heated up, you make your coffee. It's like the whole process of it made it a little bit more enjoyable to me. My drink up at Cafe Desso, my parents' shop, is the, uh, is the cold brew with a little bit of vanilla sweet cream. The Joe Musco, yes. The 44. Whether it's a cup of Joe or a home-cooked family meal, the Musgrove's Italian traditions and roots run deep. My mom can cook up just about anything. The Italian food is definitely her specialty. Because everything we did was always based around, you know, eating and, you know, making it a big, a big deal with the meal. So um, our holidays are probably the best thing, though. Everyone in our family loves to cook and cook together. So it was always like a massive crowd of people in the kitchen. You know, we do Feast of the Seven Fishes on Christmas Eve. Um, Christmas Day is a huge Italian feast with stuffed shells and lasagnas and breaded chicken and, and everything, you name it. Tell us the meaning uh, behind the necklace that you wear. Yes, the Italian horn. It's protection from the evil eye. Italians believe that you can be cursed or someone can put bad juju on you with, uh, with, with a look. This is supposed to be given to you by someone that's close to you, someone that's a loved one in your family, someone that has some meaning. And the impact of, of the horn only serves its purpose if it is gifted to you. Yeah, I've had it on since I was like 14 years old and never take it off. Those traditions helped shape a bond between the Musgrove family at a time when Joe and his siblings needed it most. I was a sophomore in high school. My dad got sick. He got Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is an autoimmune deficiency. And he had a flu bug, like a normal cold. Your immune system goes out to attack that virus that you have and get rid of your cold. And in his case, after it attacked the virus, it didn't shut off. It looked for something else to attack in his body and it went after his peripheral nervous system. 
Well, it happened in 08, in June of 08. And um, it was really touch and go. I was in ICU. At the time, I was paralyzed from, you know, from the, the shoulders down. It took a group effort. I remember Joe and Marisa alternating nights in the hospital, sleeping on a cot with him. Seeing that time in our life when our dad got sick was the hardest thing that I think any of us have ever gone through, still to this day. Um, Joe was at a very vulnerable stage just being a teenager in high school and, you know, having so much on him with scouts starting to come around for baseball. My mom was, was back and forth between running us kids all over the place to, uh, to cooking meals and making sure we were fed and taken care of and, um, you know, running meals down to my dad. As a wife and a mother and having a business to run, it wasn't easy. I remember uh, having Joe over to my bedside and asked everybody else to leave. I mean, it was life changing for me at the time. I was 15 and, you know, for a minute, I thought I was gonna lose my dad. And I remember us sitting in the hospital having talks about here's how things are gonna have to go. If I don't, you know, if I end up passing on, this is, this is what you need to do. These are, you know, the people you need to contact. This is who you need. And I was terrified. He was going to have to make some life altering decisions. He handled it really well. I think, you know, maybe he internalized some things and they might have reflected in some things, maybe his grades or something like that for a short period of time. There was a point in time in which he became ineligible, but didn't tell the coaches why it was that he wasn't getting to his studies and things. So I remember uh, Tony, Tony Gwen and Mark Martinez came to talk to Joe because uh, they were checking up on him and the school was telling him, well, his grades were really starting to fall. They were a little curious as to why I wasn't, you know, I was so well-rounded on the field and couldn't keep it together off the field. And I explained to him the, the position my dad was in and he respected that I was, you know, there for my father and you know, he was just a huge support piece for me. He talked to the right people and my dad was always there no matter what point of the illness my dad was in. He was always telling Joe, do not skip practice. Do not miss out on these things, you know. This is something that you love and this is going to be your future. And Tony gave me that chance and, and offered me, you know, the full ride at that point in my in my life. And, um, you know, to not only me, but my family, he was the piece that gave us like that, that little bit of hope and everything seemed like it was, you know, going downhill for us. That was the one piece that we were all kind of hanging on to. Once he came home, it's like a new light was lifted. And just being home from being at a hospital or a care facility for almost three months. So then our life just started moving forward. He's able to walk now, he can drive, he takes care of himself, he's fully functioning. But I think at 15, like going through that and experiencing that at the age I did, it made me mature a little bit sooner than I had planned on. It was very impactful for not only me, but for everybody in my family. Coming up. I just remember everybody opening their doors and like running down the hall like, oh my gosh, this is happening, he's coming home. Job of Joe having a night in the heart of Texas. You never really consider a no hitter until you're in that sixth, seventh inning and then it's really like a push for the last final nine outs. Padres Spotlight will be right back. After a standout baseball career as a Grossmont Hilltopper, Joe Musgrove eventually decided it was best to declare for the 2011 MLB Draft. He was selected in the first round, 46th overall by the Toronto Blue Jays. However, Joe never stepped foot north of the border. In 2013, he was traded to the Houston Astros, eventually making his Major League debut in 2016. A year later, Joe would take the mound for the eventual 2017 World Series champions. After Houston, Joe was once again traded, this time to the Steel City, where he played three seasons for the Pittsburgh Pirates. It would be Joe's last stop before heading home to San Diego for what would be the turning point of his career. I see a, a tweet that says, uh, Mama Musgrove must be losing her mind right now. And I thought, what? And so I'd scroll down and it says, Joe Musgrove traded to the Padres. 
I just remember everybody opening their doors and like running down the hall, like, oh my gosh, this is happening, he's coming home. I'm sitting there, um, his first start at home, almost in tears, because I just can't believe what I'm seeing that we got from travel ball to the big leagues. Start number two with a Padres uniform for Joe Musgrove. John and Joe on the hill in the heart of Texas. We have really specific seats in our front room. You know, I sit in this chair for every game. Marisa is here, Tara is here, my wife is here. Because of him traveling so much and being on different teams that were so far away from home, we kind of made it this routine that we would all try to watch the games together on days that he pitched. When I was warming up, I think I was the first game of that road trip. We'd just flown from San Diego to Texas, and you know, sometimes after those long flights and you know, sleeping in a hotel bed that you're not used to, you wake up feeling a little funky. So when I went to the field that night, I definitely did not feel good. In the bullpen, I, I don't think I threw a single ball over the plate you know, before I went in for that outing. And um, I said, hey, well, I guess we'll just find it out there. And that's in there for strike three. First strike out of the night for Joe Musgrove, two down. And a swing and a miss. Musgrove with back-to-back -back K's in the first. Into the shift, it's Machado who throws him out with Musgrove covering. And a high drive to right field that is going to hang up. Yeah, the Espresso Express right now. He's been outstanding so far. He's retired all six batters that he's faced. Second or third inning rolls through, and he's, you know, he's doing well. That's in there for strike three. Buckled him right there. Fourth strikeout for Musgrove. We get up to about the fifth inning, and I my knee starts, you know, uncontrollably, you know, I'm, I'm shaking my knee, and I'm tapping the floor with my foot, and and this starts happening more and more, and I can't get comfortable. Java Joe having a night in the heart of Texas. That'll work, strike three, eight strikeouts from Musgrove. Make it nine. Uh, striking out for the third time is Tejeda, one out of the seventh inning for Joe Musgrove. He has been a strike machine today, Joe Musgrove. Two outs in the seventh inning. I went to meet a friend to go to the gym. And when I met him, the game was on, and I was watching it, and I, I saw that uh, there was a no-hitter alert on the screen. That night, you know, you always think, like, oh, it could happen, and then as it starts getting to the fourth, fifth, sixth inning, and then, you know, Valley Sports put it up on TV, <laughs> no-hit innings through this many, and I started getting nervous. You never really consider a no-hitter until you're in that sixth, seventh inning, and then it's really like a push for the last final nine outs, so I think probably around that, like, Sixth, seventh, I think once I got out of the seventh, that's when I really started thinking about it and started pushing for it. That is strike three. He's not allowed to hit through seven. Yeah, there's multiple moments in that game where you know, I thought we might lose it. Joe Musgrove is not allowed to hit through the first eight. My sister and my family, they were like, turn off the phones, no one even say it, nobody talk about it, just watch the game. Tara looks over at me, and I look at her, and I said, I just gave her a shake, but don't say a word. They follow every superstition. You know, when they're at games watching me pitch, they don't want anyone talking to them. They don't want their phones going off. They like to sit and focus and watch the game. Joe Musgrove, alone in his thoughts again in the dugout. On to the bottom of the ninth inning back at Globe Life Field in Texas, where the Padres have a 3 0 lead, and Joe Musgrove is trying to make history tonight on behalf of the San Diego Padres. My initial instinct was, uh, you know, I didn't think no hitter. I just because he always goes, he goes pretty deep usually without hits. So I get to the gym and I'm doing my exercises. I look up on the screen and it's an, it's the ninth inning and it's just it's happening right there. He wants to get to that finish line. When you get into that ninth inning, you just you could hardly breathe because you know it's just going to be that one hit that gets through. In the course of the game, you're trying so hard to like manage your emotions and to keep everything calm and just stay focused on the task at hand. Grounder down the first baseline. He'll tag him himself. Two down. One out away. The Friar Faithful stand is one in Texas. And that final out is made, and it's just an eruption. Grab ball to shortstop. 
Kim will go to first. The San Diego Padres get their first no-hitter in the history of the franchise. And it belongs to San Diego's own Joe Musgrove. From the stadium, from the fans, from the players storming down the field. It's one of the most exciting moments you can experience. The kid comes home and he gets it done. Couldn't have picked a better individual for this to actually happen to him. Yeah, I started balling because the accomplishment to me was just overwhelming. We all just hugged each other. We were crying. Everybody was excited and happy, but just kind of in shock. And I remember looking over at mom and she wasn't moving and she wasn't saying anything. And when they started screaming, Tara goes, what's wrong with you, mom? I, I still couldn't believe it. When an angel, when he got off camera, he called us right away. My family has been extremely supportive of me. Like I said, as kids, my sisters sacrificed a lot of their time and um, you know their passions to come follow me around and let me play baseball and kind of pursue my dream. So being able to share some of this stuff with them has been some of the most rewarding for me to be able to feel like I'm giving them back a little bit of, of the time and effort and money that everyone spent for me to get here. It was exciting to make that phone call and hear the hear the, the tears in their voice, you know. To throw the first no-hitter in Padres history, I still can't really put a feeling or a, an emotion to it. Having him be the first no-hitter in franchise history is so special to our family, but I know how special it is to him. He was that kid sitting in the stands. Just an amazing feat to be the first one to do it and be the hometown kid to do it. It kind of made it feel like he was meant to be here. At the time, I, you know, I hadn't even thought about the history of the Padres and how they'd gone so long without one and come so close. And the moment, it's just so overwhelming. To have your hometown kid be the one that gets rid of the goose egg, I don't think it could have been a, a better person that's done it. And I think that was the first time I've ever made it through all my pieces of gum in one sitting. Coming up. I got hooked up with a guy named Prime Hall who runs Deep End Fitness. They're ex-military special ops guys specialized in water survival training. That class really showed me a lot about how my mind works and like when I get nervous or stressed out, where my mind goes. And I just love the idea of going to that class, knowing that you're gonna get beat and knowing it's gonna be brutal and it's gonna be hard. Padre Spotlight will be right back. Music sets the tone for your workouts. And it's all it's all about the mood you're in, I guess, or what you're trying to get out of the workout. If we're lifting heavy one day and really getting after it, sometimes it'll be some, you know, some rock music. Ready? Push, 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 push. There you go. Drive, 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 drive. Nice. Come on. Woo! Some hardcore rap. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Drive, drive, drive. Oops. Yeah, different vibes for different times. Come on. Yeah. You know, if we're doing like a, a mobility day, it'll be some reggae. We usually always have reggae going for like our warm up because we're stretching out and rolling out and doing a little cardio stuff. <laughs> like we don't use any of this footage. <laughs> You're way over yeah. there. Yeah, so get off that backside probably a little bit more and think about getting your head directly over that foot. There we go. Let's go, come on. I got hooked up with a guy named Prime Hall who runs Deep End Fitness. They're ex-military special ops guys specialized in water survival training. They take some of those things that they've learned and they've kind of related them to professional athletes in different sports. I kind of just threw the opportunity out there for guys and then guys jumped on it. Water can be and is scary to a lot of individuals, so it's a huge growth place. You can get a lot of growth. So everything that we do is systematic, 
crawl, walk, run, building block approach to training to where everybody has a warm and fuzzy and is confident after completing step one to now move to step two and step three and step four. It's, it's so hard to explain unless you can experience it for yourself. I don't think anybody can go underwater for an extended amount of time and not experience that, that sense of panic or nerves that set in. And in a sense, it relates to what we do. You know, we're constantly in those high leverage pressure situations with a lot on the line and all these thoughts come into your head. You start panicking a little bit. You think farther down the line than what's right in front of you. That class really showed me a lot about how my mind works and like when I get nervous or stressed out, where my mind goes and, and how distracting and limiting it is. I did that class for 17 weeks this off season, um, every Wednesday, and I went from a one minute, like a one minute 18 breath hold to four minutes, two second breath hold underwater. And I didn't all of a sudden become this master diver or be able to hold my breath, it was just learning how to, how to manage the thoughts going on in my head. I just love the idea of going to that class, knowing that you're gonna get beat and knowing it's gonna be brutal and it's gonna be hard but challenging yourself mentally to find a way to get past that barrier and get a little bit better every week. <laughs> Off the diamond and in the clubhouse, his relationships with teammates and coaches was clearly growing as he was emerging as a leader for the 2022 Padres. The way that I play the game is always player first. Like I always want to earn the respect of my teammates and my coaches before anybody else. But ultimately, when they're out there on the field, it's it's you and your teammates, and that's who you learn the most from. Like your pitching coaches are going to make impacts and they're going to have mechanical adjustments and mental cues and stuff. But I don't think you get the same thing from a coach that you do from a player that's in the trenches with you and going through the same thing and experiencing the same stuff and has been through the failures that you've been through. So my very first priority is to make sure that the guys in my clubhouse and the coaches that I'm playing for um, respect me and that they trust me. And I'm always you know, taking pride in my ability to, to do whatever I'm asked of. You know, if it's coming out of the bullpen, I'll do it. If it's starting a game, I'll do it. I just never complain. I just take what I'm, what I'm given and make the most of it. Swing and a miss, and Musgrove out of the jam. Joe Musgrove getting it done. As starting pitchers, we're, we're once every five days, and when your day's over, you got to sit by for the rest of the, the week and then wait till your turn again. So. When we're working with each other in the offseason, these are things that we're talking about is, you know, what can you bring to the table when you're not on the mound? The Polaroid thing is one of my favorite things we've seen in a couple of years. It, it's kind of like Swag Chain 2.0, but a little bit more team oriented. And I love the idea that, that Joe came up with and kind of this way to memorialize all the wonderful things that have happened. I think Joe hit a home run on this one. I just think it brings the team together. Before any moment was ever captured in 2022, the idea of Musgrove being signed to a long-term deal was top of mind amongst the Friar faithful and the front office. A lockout between the league and their players would put a halt to any negotiations starting before the 2022 season. However, Joe remained focused on the task at hand. Um, you know, I'm just going to focus on continuing to throw the ball well and um, just continuing to do my job. And then maybe down the line, things will open back up again. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. I got to have a strong year here and, you know, help us get into the postseason. So that's kind of where my focus is at. And I think it helps me a lot to be able to, you know, table that stuff for now and, and worry about it at a later time. Joe Musgrove started his 2022 campaign in Cy Young form, recording a 1.59 ERA through his first 12 games. In the first half of the season, Musgrove had gone 9-2 with a sub-2 ERA and a National League leading 14 quality starts. He would even make an attempt at a second no-hit bid, going eight innings against the Milwaukee Brewers on June 3rd. After every inning, I would look over at Don and say, he's got it working tonight. You know, at that point, I give up a hit or whatever. I'm still seven scoreless, and it's a pretty good night. Ranking among the top pitchers in the National League and ultimately earning his first nod to the Midsummer Classic just up the road in Hollywood. Yeah, I mean, getting a pitch in the All-Star game is uh, one of the top accomplishments for me so far in my career. It's the people that you get to be around, to be recognized as one of the best in the league and one of the best in the world. That was what up, bro? Joe. Doing, man? Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, bro. 
first or second year in San Diego? Uh, okay. Second year. Last year I got traded over, so my second year now. Liking it up there? I love it, bro. I'm from San Diego too, oh. so it's been so nice. I found a really good team around me, so getting to share that moment with all of them as well, having it be in LA was the coolest part of all of it, but getting to step in and actually getting to throw in the game was cool. You know, a lot of guys get invited and either the schedule doesn't line up or they choose not to throw, but I, I told them, I said, if I get an opportunity, I'm absolutely taking that ball and throwing. To get my first All-Star game in this year, it does give you like that little bit of motivation to get back there again. It's almost like I'm raising my bar and raising the expectation for myself. Coming up. Obviously a uh, super exciting day uh, for our franchise and Padre fans in the city of San Diego here to announce a five-year contract with Joe Musgrove. It's going to be hard to top mom's meals, but we will be eating good. <laughs> Padre Spotlight will be right back. Love Joe, love what he represents, uh, you know, both on and off the field. Uh, the pitcher he is, the, the person he is, and Hopefully he's, uh, he's here in, in the Padre uniform for a long time. Much to the delight of the Friar faithful, the hometown kid, Joe Musgrove, would remain a Padre. How you doing, Joe? Pretty good, man. Yeah. You ready? Obviously a uh, super exciting day uh, for our franchise and we knew we were going to get to this day. It's just maybe a little matter of when and how. Uh, we're super excited to be here and announce a five-year deal with Joe Musgrove. You know, getting a chance to come back here and compete for a championship has is, is been a goal of mine since I was a little kid. And the opportunity to win here is, um, I think, everyone's goal. So um, I couldn't be happier with it. It's going to be hard to top mom's meals, but we will be eating good. <laughs> Signing Joe was huge. Joe is Padres baseball. Great to have Joe on board and be a part of this organization and a part of this city. He's right where he belongs. Joe comes in as the hometown kid. He starts to have more success than he's had at any other point in his career, and he's rewarded for it. The guy is a leader. He's got guts. He's a gamer. There's a term in sports where a guy gets it. Joe Musgrove gets it from every angle. You know, to, to feel like I'm repaying in, in some kind of manner um, all the effort and time and money that was spent for me to get here, um, it's a really good feeling. He was just absolutely ecstatic that he was going to be here for the next five years and maybe more and it made him feel so relaxed and so appreciated and so warm about the fact that he was going to be here long term. His signing of his extension was probably the greatest highlight for me. I think that security of knowing that he's gonna be here at home and that we're gonna be able to be a part of his career and going to see the games, you know, family members that can come and see the games is the greatest thing we could ask for. It's nice to see that the organization appreciates his talents and well, kind of validates his talents to some degree. It's so cool is being able to go to work and live our normal lives and then it's just a 20 minute drive down to the ballpark to watch him play. So knowing that we get to do that for the next five years and not have to coordinate like big travel plans and flights is gonna be really exciting. Knowing that I'm gonna be in Petco for the next five years is, um, is a really good feeling. Obviously because I'm from here and I got a lot of things that are going well for me here. Yeah, I couldn't be happier to be here. The Padres would eventually finish the regular season with an 89 and 73 record, earning themselves the fifth seed in a best of three series versus the New York Mets in the wild card round. Splitting games one and two, Joe Musgrove was asked to take the hill in a win or go home game three. I mean, Joe's pitched well for us all year, but yeah, I think this team takes a lot of confidence with Joe. You know, you kind of rely on the, the compounding effect of the hard work and the trust, and you go out there and you just compete with everything you got, and you kind of let the chips fall where they may. And the Padres strike first two to nothing here in the second inning. So I got a notification that said on-field delay, and then I see them start to get together and, and go out to check Joe. In the middle of a dominating performance, Mets manager Buck Showalter made a desperate attempt to break the focus of Joe Musgrove. They just said they, they were going to check him. So, and that included his glove, that included his hand, and that included um, 
you know, obviously his face. Yeah, you're not going to find nothing. But yeah, at that point I was so dialed in and, and so focused on, on getting out, so it didn't really, you know, affect me too much. You know, to see him come back with a little more edge, that's the way I wanted it to end. There will be playoff baseball at Petco Park in 2022. I feel like I learned a lot about myself in here tonight. Musgrove would become the first pitcher in postseason history to go seven plus innings and allow fewer than two hits in a winner take all game as the Padres advanced to the divisional round. The stage was set for Musgrove to pitch in a potential game four versus their rivals, the Los Angeles Dodgers, in the National League Divisional Series. On October 15th, Joe Musgrove arrived at Petco Park, rocking his childhood hero's uniform of Jake Peavy. I think it's about time that we start talking about San Diego as a sports town. This is special. Uh, having Joe being a fan and being in this ballpark as a kid. In front of the sellout crowd he grew up dreaming of playing for, Musgrove helped his team to an improbable series clinching win. The series is over! And the Padres have slayed the Dragon. They defeat the Dodgers in four games to advance to the National League Championship Series. The Padres would come up short in their attempt for a first World Series ring, falling to the Phillies in the NLCS in five games. You know, it's never easy losing, but for the fans in San Diego, this is obviously a tough time. Everyone's upset, but um, you know they have a lot to be excited about about this team and, and what's to come for the next years. I came and toured the neighborhood in, in Point Loma and I fell in love with it immediately. You know, we got to interact with some of the kids down at the baseball field and it seemed like a really cool baseball community. So everything kind of fit in right and it was the right house, the right time and the right place. Now that Musgrove has his feet grounded in his new home, he plans on leaving a mark not only in the Padres record books, but as someone this city, his new community and the Friar Faithful can be proud to call their own. If you lived in San Diego, you know, you went to games to, you know, to see Tony Gwynn and I mean, that was my hero growing up. You know, as a kid, you see him for the baseball player, you know, but as I got older, you know, you start to see the person that he was in the community and, you know, coming back to San Diego now, I kind of see myself as, as someone that, you know, has a chance to, to somewhat follow in his footsteps. And I can't say that I'll ever be, you know, who Tony Gwynn was to the city, but I'm going to do everything I can to, you know, to try to be something close to it. Joe has always been a really big advocate of community outreach. I remember when he was honored with the Clemente Award. One of the first things that he said to me when I congratulated him was like, this is the greatest thing I think that's happened in my career, like the greatest honor. That's the stuff that really touches my heart. And any kind of community work that he does um, is so special. Bringing home the first championship to San Diego, obviously it would be everything. That's why we play the game, is to win championships, to win a championship in the city that I'm from that's never won it. It'd be incredible. And I think more so than that, it's the people that we're with. I've gone through the suffering years. I've been here obviously playing through the exciting years. So it's been a long up and down road. The kid comes home. And he gets it done! You know, we have a city that is dying for a championship. I want them to know we're doing everything we can to do it.